multinational corporations dancing on the ruins of multinational corporations. Ha, 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 ha. Hello. My name is Lisa Fithian, and I'm here today to talk with you about a project I'm super excited about. It's called Kicking Corporate Booty. Kicking Corporate Booty is a flexible model of strategic organizing that will allow ordinary people to take on issues that confront their communities and win some justice. They came more than 300 strong, mad that they're losing city services while real estate magnates pile up their riches. work for maybe 20, 30 years, and only in the last year or two have I come to call it kicking corporate booty. But when I look back to the 1980s, through the 90s, 2000s, and then this last you know, 2010s, um, I've watched, I can see how the different pieces of work have been woven together, whether it be, you know, mobile tactics to comprehensive corporate campaigns to, to mass non-cooperation strategies. Now's the time for me to take what I've learned over these years, these lessons, and make it more accessible in the form of this manual. We'll look at the evolution of this model, and I want to look at some very specific case studies like the Justice for Janitors campaign, nursing home workers in the Dignity campaign, students taking on the nuclear weapons complex, the Dream Act kids, um, and community-based organizations who've taken on the Wall Street banks around debt and foreclosure. So we'll look at these case studies, we'll examine all the principles, look at the tools, the skills we need. hope this book will help thousands if not millions of people around the planet have the confidence, the in, in, information and experience they need to go kick corporate booty and win some justice for a change. Thanks. A word, on the ruins of multinational corporations. Kicking Corporate Booty, Lisa, Lisa Fithian. Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos, and I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York. Social movements by ordinary, everyday people have always fascinated, intrigued, and sometimes terrified students and observers of the phenomenon. Progressives, have tended to believe that significant structural and radical change, taking on the long arc of the moral universe, bending towards justice, largely comes through and because of social movements. Here's an example of that progressive plea passionately and eloquently called for by Mario Savio way back in his famous 1964 sit-in address on the steps of Sprawl Hall in Berkeley, California. Following, if President Kerr actually tried to get something more liberal out of the regions in his telephone conversations, why didn't he make some public statement to that effect? And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That's the answer. Well, I ask you to consider. If this is a firm, and if the Board of Regents are the Board of Directors, and if President Kerr, in fact, is the manager, then I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees, and we're the raw materials. But we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be, have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product, don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. <laughs> There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Put your body on those gears. Progressive movement organizers also have had to be concerned by counter-movements, which often saw these calls and cries for freedom and justice as dangerous uprisings by the unruly mob. The simple historical fact is that most of the time, most ordinary people in most societies accept their lot in life and abide by or try to abide by the rules and norms of their society. At times, they may 
take out their misery and anger in self-destructive or other distorted and destructive ways. They can also become tools of demagogic politicians who use them to foment counter-movements that scapegoat them further and suppress them. It's only rarely and for relatively brief moments of history that challenging authority takes the form of protest energy that leads to principled movements of social justice, liberation, and as our guest today on the show puts it, become spiritual pursuits that reclaim our humanity and protect what we love. That's where the skilled, committed, and creative activist organizer comes in. And our guest today on The Radical Imagination has shut down the CIA, she's occupied Wall Street, disrupted the World Trade Organization, she stood her ground in Tahrir Square, she's walked in solidarity with tribal leaders at Standing Rock, defended communities in the wake of Hurricane Katrina and Ferguson and on and on. She's the nation's best known protest consultant and is living proof that the best way to radically and rapidly transform the ills of our society is through nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience. It's much more than acts of, res of, of resistance though. She's trying to help build a political, economic, and spiritual transformation in the country and the world that's grounded in strong beliefs, creativity, and sheer unwavering courage. She's the author of the newly published, critically acclaimed, Shut It Down, stories from a fierce, loving resistance with a foreword by Francis Fox Piven. She's the epitome of what this show tries to be about. So glad she's here on the show. Welcome Lisa Fithian to the Radical Imagination. Excited to be here and I love this opening. Well, you inspire a lot of it. And we have, we've, we've only met once, but there was a connection that goes way back uh, in a sense uh, as I read more and more about you, as I have read your book, Shutting It Down, uh, forward by Francis Fox Piven, and the, let's start with that beautiful message by your father, and we'll work into the historical connections that we both have. Your father said what? Science and poetry was once one. It's magic. What did he mean by that, and how does that, how has that influenced your own work and creativity? Mm. You know, sometimes we call it the art and science of change, but I think really what this means is that there are um, real concrete uh, skills and tools and ways of knowing that are a foundation for this work, but there's also the alchemy of when you bring people together um, there's, and you combine it all and you bring in our imagination and our creativity, magic happens. Right. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't always know what's gonna, what we're gonna create, but um, I've just seen again and again is that when we bring our wisdom, skills and knowledge and con collect, connect it to that sort of collective imagination and energy, we can do amazing things and become an unstoppable force. Absolutely. Now, why hasn't that happened in the past? We have un, un, such an uneven history. And as I said in the opening, most people accept their lot in life, even though they realize it's, it's so anger provoking and, and, and anxiety provoking. Why is it, do you think, that we have been put in this position that we haven't taken the sort of action to fully liberate us? Uh, again, I know we've had times where we've done that, but, but why has it been so difficult? Well, I think there's a couple things around that. One is that we live in a culture that teaches us that we don't have power. Um, and we are, you know, there are so many things that happen that are unjust and harmful, that there's a sense of overwhelm and feeling like there's nothing we can do about it. But I think the other piece that's really important to understand is that, again, this whole sort of dominant culture that we live in mm -hmm. uh, has a long history of um, um, doing harm 
uh, when you do rise up and try and reclaim your power through violence and ultimately spreading fear. And mm -hmm. so I don't know that we just accept our lot as much as we are afraid to give up challenge what we it. have. Right. Uh, because we know that if we do try and challenge, you know, some injustice or some uh, somebody that abused their powers, we could be hurt even more. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So I think that there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we have to overcome in order to sort of step into our agency to try and make a change. Absolutely. And you're, you're really a pioneer uh, in, in, in the study and activism of all of this. Marx, I think you may agree, had a pretty simplistic notion about all of this. Uh, his feeling was that conditions of capitalism would, would lead to such feelings of miseration, of misery, that there would almost be this automatic, spontaneous rebellion against the oppressors. And, and it's much more complicated than that, right? There's a lot of form, there's a form, there's a lot of forms that this energy can take. And I think that's where the creativity comes in that you're, you're talking about here. As you as an organizer takes this diffuse uh, combination of, of very mixed, conflicted emotions and, and fears and, and aspirations that people are wanting, basically decent, good people who are corrupted by structural, uh, historical, um, forces that they feel uh, are beyond their control. And so you're, you become, and other organizer activists become so important in crystallizing and getting us to raise our consciousness about it and offer the strategies, the tactics to take the form of a principled uh, social movement in the face of, you're right, the, the overwhelming, oftentimes overwhelming power of the state to control, to arrest us, to put us in prison, and of course, I saying all of that, I want to compliment you on your T-shirt today, which we'll we'll cut to, and it says "Arrest Trump." So mm -hmm. that's turning the tables on the authority there, right? Uh, yeah. There it is, "Arrest Trump." Okay, so that's outland. That's that's magic. <laughs> that's magic. It would be wonderful magic, but uh, but still, it, it goes beyond Trump. But but again, what form does this energy take, or could take? as you struggle, uh, as you go around the country, around the world, uh, meeting all kinds of people with all kinds of issues? Well, I mean, I guess one of the things I, I would say is that, you know, misery begets misery. Mm. And mm. misery and injustice can invoke anger and, out, and outrage. But I really learned to see that it's our when we have some vision, some aspiration for something better, something more just, that that is really more of a key to what is going to move people into action. So part of this, you know, you talk about the energy is, you know, I've been looking more and more like what inspires uprisings and social yeah. movements. And part of it, there are, yes, the political conditions um, that, you know, what are the political conditions that are going to uh, sort of create that anger and urgency, but then what is the aspiration that will then move people? And so Occupy was kind of an example of that, where the 2008 bailout and then this massive foreclosure crisis where many people were being hurt and there was a lot of pain being spread across this, this nation. And then this Occupy concept came in, which was sort of an aspiration and imaginative. And it's like, let's Occupy, and again, it was a small group of people, you know, that crafted that and threw down. Mm -hmm. And again, who would have believed what would have come out of that? Absolutely. You know, it was kind of beyond our imagination that that's actually what would have happened. But we tapped into both the anger and the hope and, um, and it spread like wildfire. Absolutely. So it's, it's feelings that people have and the ideas that they then make out of those feelings, as well as then seeing the possible alternatives or resources that they might then pursue, uh, all, always keeping in mind too that there is going to be, or probably will be, a societal reaction of oppression. And, and what you said was so, uh, so right on, um, how few people can and, and we're going to play at the very end of this, uh, of our interview, uh, Leonard Cohen's famous 
uh, a song about um, opening up the cracks and letting the light shine in and so on. But it doesn't take all that many people. And I, and I want to just personalize this a little bit to you and our audience um, by saying this. Um, as a graduate student uh, at Columbia, I met, uh, became my very close dear friend for many years until he passed on, Jim Dunn. And during mm -hmm. that time of our uh, association in grad school, he, he did a dissertation, worked on uh, creating a foundation called Help Us Make a Nation, Human. And uh, Jim was this incredibly charismatic figure who was so inclusive. This was at the social work school where my mentor was Richard Cloward, who uh, a partner and the husband's uh, wife was, of course, uh, Francis Fox Piven, who you've worked with and so on. But Jim, uh, I, I very remember so distinctively, as if it was yesterday, would say, um, would organize alternative events at the school. And he would just be so open, said, sure, you want to come? Come with. That was his phrase. Come with. And it led to an alternative graduation, 1970, in which Dick Gregory was the uh, spokesperson. Now, uh, we won't go on to that. I didn't graduate at that time. I was so sick of social work school, I, I went into sociology. But that's not here nor there. But again, it was the alternatives that he, not just him, but he reached people at that school in, in, our, in our graduate program. And there were certainly enough people who were upset about it and were looking for alternatives. And he was there. And out of this, uh, help us make a nation, uh, after he passed on, it became uh, People's Institute for, the Su for Survival and Beyond. Uh, Director Ron Chisholm, who you've worked with and make special note of here in your book. So I'd like you to touch on those connections, perhaps. And again, the courage and the belief that alternatives are possible and just trying and opening up and you never know where it's going to reach, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the only permanent condition is change mm. and alternatives, you know, when we're living in a culture that is so rigid and, um, uh, you know, there's a way in which alternatives are all we have. And I like to tell the story that as we were leading up to the Battle of Seattle, which the 20th anniversary is this coming weekend, yes. Yes. The, the neoliberal order basically had this thing called Tina. There is no alternative and mm. basically was positioning that, you know, this new era of global trade world rules was inevitable. Yep. Um, and we didn't believe that. Right. And we didn't just say we're going to try and tweak it here and there. We said we were going to shut it down. Mm -hmm. And part of the way that we were able to shut that down successfully was by, you know, creating a convergent space having a ton of art projects and puppetry and culture, making sure there was food, there was legal support, uh, you know, there was training, preparation. So it was like that building that alternative world. And I always talk about that there's two fundamental strategies for change, dismantling the systems, processes, and beliefs of oppression while simultaneously creating the systems, processes, and beliefs of liberation. Because you can't tear it all down without having something to replace it. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the more I, you know, my father, again, I, he handed me a book once called Complexity Science, the Emerging Science on the Edge of Order and Chaos. And I was fascinated by it because I was like, oh, chaos is part of what we're doing, organized chaos. And I began to learn that there was a science behind the work we did. And um, one of those pieces about that is that, you know, there's this concept of an edge of chaos and it's that edge of chaos where the potential for new things to emerge are and but what's going to be emerging is based on what are the foundations or the models from before yeah to so build on the, absolutely some of this organizing we call it free, prefigurative organizing mm -hmm. so again in this work for creating you know fundamental social change how we do the work and how we care for one another um, is as important as how we are in our resistance. Absolutely. Um, and that in fact, that prefigurative work is a form of resistance because we are laying the foundation for, for a new order. A new and order, yeah. the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, which have been 
um, my primary teachers on learning about uh, undoing racism and white supremacy, they have a set of principles. And one of the principles is like to, to network. And the way they articulate that is to build a net that works to hold us all. And so this work around nonviolent direct action, in order to really be truly successful and to get to scale, requires us to build a net that works to hold us all. Because, you know, taking on the state, it's not a joke, it's not a game, it's serious, which is also why I talk about how sacred it is, because we have to actually be willing to put our lives on the line and take great risks. And when we're socialized to live in fear, it's really hard to move people out of that to be willing to take risks. And one of the only ways that really enable people to do that is when they feel like they're part of a beloved community and they're getting supported and they know that they're not alone. So, you know, all of this work, you know, thank you, Jim Dunn. Thank mm. you, Human. You know, thank you yeah. all those who came before me that helped lay the foundation and the ground that I'm walking on today. Um, and so much gratitude to the People's Institute because you know, I've been doing this movement work a long time and I have watched racism take us apart in every movement. And so I, several years ago when I took a sabbatical to write this book, I um, decided I wasn't gonna just work on any one movement or issues. I really wanted to confront racism and see what we could do. And that led to a whole organizing campaign in Austin where we we brought in the People's Institute and literally trained thousands of people, organizers and activists and leaders in our city and then we started to infiltrate the, the, the city structures, the system. And we've seen tremendous changes and victories led by community that have had real impact on people's lives, including like the defeat of the police contract with the, with the new one once it got approved with all the community demands, defeat of a major land gentrification code, defeat of legislation to criminalize homeless folks. So, um, yeah, I just think that this work to take on racism and for those of us that are white to seriously work to heal ourselves from white supremacy so that we don't continue to enact it, that's foundational for building this new world. Absolutely. If I could ask, what, what did your father do? What was he doing? It's a, what was his field and career, I mean, whatever? He, he was a photographer, photographer. cameraman, uh, you know, we, we were born in Georgia, but we moved to New York. He started getting into advertising. Huh. But in 72, he sort of started to lose his mind in that world and really? literally dropped out and moved out into the woods and built a house in the woods and then lived there till his, till his passing um, in 2015. Uh -huh. So he, um, he, he unplugged from that toxic system. And I think he was really working to try and save his life. Wow. And, and your mom? She, um, you know, they were divorced when I was young and she worked multiple jobs, um, ultimately was a bookkeeper. And, um, you know, she, she struggled like many single moms to raise their right. kids. Right. Uh, but did, did the best that she could. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 A little, just a brief little follow up on Jim Dunn again, because I think it's so important what you're hitting on. You know, it's the academics oftentimes that look down on issues of love and transformation and uh, have uh, events and, and conferences, for example, at John Jay every year, smart on crime, same sort of stuff. Only don't expect, imagine too much. This is the only reasonable so-called scientific way that we can change the system, reform, and so on, so on. So, Oftentimes the academics are, are stuck in that sort of mode, but it's so much about basic human relationships that starts, you talk about your affinity groups and being able to care for each other. And of course it starts with, you know, the mother loving you and caring for you and, and the father and, and the infant realizing that there's a, a good world out there that takes care of their needs and hopefully does. But, but the, the brief story with Jim is early on in our friendship, uh, he was always driving around, and his home was in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and he had a, uh, a, a speech to give in Columbus, which was a 10-hour drive from New York. And I was always driving these drive-away cars, and for whatever reason, going back to Boulder, where I was an undergraduate in California, and so on and so on. So I said, why don't you come along for this ride? It was the middle of winter, 
It was a 10 hour auto trip. It took three days. The car broke down a couple, two, three times, whatever. Um, snowstorms, avalanche, you name it. And there was a point in time on the highway and whatever it was, Route 80, I said, look, Jim, this is, thanks, but I don't, why don't you get a ride with somebody else? That's okay, because this is gonna take a long time. And he said, nope, we're in this. We're in this together. It took us three days. We got to Dayton about an hour before his talk. And he said, I got enough time to get to Columbus. But that's the sort of relationships you're trying to build, right? And, and, and getting people to care for each other, go beyond themselves and reduce the fear that we're all out there alone or that we can't do this and that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, that's one reason that, you know, I also, you know, continue to live a life engaged in direct action and movement building because when you have to face the fire and you go through the storm, yeah. uh, it, there's a bonding that takes place and we are in this together and we need one another. So, you know, part of, you know, white culture uh, is, this, is this way of being that's rooted in transaction, you know? You know I'm trying to get something from you. It's always right. a, an exchange of like, um, you know, for the most part in this culture, it's like money and making You're a profit. commodity. Come on. Um, but what we're really looking for is not that transactional relationship, but that transformative relationship. And that transformative relationship only happens when we have authentic connections, when we build trust, when we when we can feel safe enough that we're not going to be judged or criticized, that we can make a mistake and not be the mistake, but that we can take responsibility and make amends. And so I do believe there are ways of being. Um, that existed before these uh, oppressions of supremacy, before capitalism. And a lot of what we're needing to do right now is to reclaim and go back to the old ways while also, you know, taking the wisdom that has been emerging from these generations and our ancestors and move forward. Mm -hmm. And one of those pieces that I'm particularly working with right now and that has been, uh, I believe, gifting to our current movements because of new knowledge around trauma and our neurological systems and what our ability to rewire and heal ourselves. But we've all been traumatized. And when we're traumatized, we tend to react, we tend to distance, we tend to other even more, we tend to judge, judge, uh, judge and criticize. And so I think there's this deep healing work we need to do that can become the, the container, let's say, of um, building new relationships. Absolutely. And, and your book here takes off on the manual that you previously law, uh, uh, wrote. And there's so much in here. There's so much detail and strategy and incredible stories, such vivid stories of your own experiences and others in the movements here. Um, there's so much to talk about here. Let's start with how you approach the problem of, of organizing. Not a problem, but you use horizontal organizing, correct? Direct, what, explain a little more for our audience what you mean by direct action, civil disobedience, affinity groups, horizontal organizing, consensus building, building the sort of empathy, the, the uh, you know, tikkun, tikkun alam, healing, transformation of the world. Right. Well, you're just a sort, lot of, you're sort of articulated all the pieces or elements that go into the creation of a, of a new paradigm. Right. Um, so those were a lot of questions in one. But let me just say that, you know, for me, in many ways, d direct action, uh, people often articulate as the ability to intervene into an unjust situation mm. to do what needs to be done without asking permission. Um, it's that direct intervention. It might be like shutting down the assembly line in a power plant. Um, where, and, and direct action doesn't necessarily involve going to jail, where civil disobedience is a much more intentional act to put yourself in a position where you would be willing to risk going to jail. And I want to be clear, nobody wants to go to jail, but we're willing to risk it. And that's also a piece that we need to understand is that 
you know, we don't decide to be arrested. The police make that decision. And so then our choices are always about how much we cooperate or not with those arrests. And so I was raised up in this movement in the early 80s uh, when there was this campaign called the Pledge of Resistance, which was this effort to try and prevent a U.S. invasion of Nicaragua. In 1979, the people overthrew a U.S.-backed dictator, uh, Anastasio Somoza, and were building a revolutionary country. And the U.S., you know, does not like alternatives to their worldview. So they, of course, tried to destabilize that, as they did in, you know, throughout Central America, U.S. intervention had been deep uh, on behalf of corporations and has also led to many decades of, you know, mass murder of mm -hmm. people throughout Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador. So this, uh, this Pledge of Resistance was working on a model of training people to understand the dynamics of power, to understand the consequences of being willing to risk arrest, to exploration of hopes and fears. But fundamentally, it got us to this place of what I call self-organizing, getting you in a small group of people that would be your action buddies and with whom, when there was a big action, you would go together, the group would, you know, be prepared to support you. Uh, some of you would risk arrest, some of you would support. For, you know, for those of you that went to jail, when you got out, your support people would be there. Yeah. And if you stayed in longer than you thought, they'd make sure that your cat got fed. Mm -hmm. And those affinity groups, we call them, again, have a long history of many movements and go back, in fact, to this term, grupos de afinidad, which were, the, were these cells that were organizing during the Spanish uh, uh, war against fascism. So um, it's a model, uh, uh, and then those affinity groups would come together into a council. And there'd be one person from each group that would form the spokes council. And when decisions needed to be made, the council would pause so that the spokes could work with their affinity group and they would decide what they would do and when they would do it and how they would do it. And that's this place of direct democracy where they were deciding for themselves how you would plug in to an overall action. Because one of the things that we've seen over many years is the rise of nonprofits and who work basically in the dominant culture of power over where you have this you know, hierarchy of staff. Yeah. And over that time, power has shifted from the people to the staff or the leadership. And so in a lot of nonprofits or community-based orgs or even labor unions, there's often a dynamic of protest or resistance where people are often told what to do. And the problem with that is that, you know, if I tell somebody, you got to go do this right now and something goes bad, they're going to blame me. Right. But if I, as a good organizer, right say to you, this is what we think needs to be done. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the consequences if you do this. You know, these are the choices that we see, the options available. What are you going to do? What do you want to do? And then they make their own decision, which is an act of their exercising their own power. If something goes wrong, I'm not to blame anymore because they chose it. Right. <clears throat> so a lot of what we need to do in today's movements is those of us that are in positions of leadership or in staff positions, we have to stop abusing our power by telling people what they need to do. We have to be, the, to be responsible organizers who are sharing information, analysis, choices, consequences, and really supporting people to make decisions for themselves. Because fundamentally, that's what we want. You know, we're too, you know, we need everybody in their power and agency taking action. And that's how we're going to form the scale of movements that we need to actually create the tipping points for fundamental change. Right. Is it fair to say this is a, a variation of participatory democracy that the Port Huron uh, people try to uh, articulate as well? Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, as, as Abby yeah. Hoffman would say, democracy only works if you participate in it. You know? Absolutely. And, and you, you were involved also with, with Abby in the Save the River campaign, right? Now, tell us a little about Abby, uh, please, and, and how he fits in and you fit in. And this, you know, the, the, the notion of 
we, know, we need to make this more joyful and, and, and fun as well um, and, and see the satire in this. Tell us a little about that. Satire and uh, your joy. I mean, I, um, yeah. Abby came to speak at my college and talked yeah. about the St. Lawrence River and the fight they had gone through and that he had a community organizing internship. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to sign up for that. Right. And filled out the application that he distributed and he wrote me A plus come on up. <laughs> um, but as I was getting ready to graduate from college, I hadn't heard anything about it. Right. And it sounded like it wasn't happening, but I had nothing to do. So I packed my car and drove up to the St. Lawrence River anyway. And, you know, not long after I arrived in the office, Abby and Johanna Lawrenson arrived and I became their flower gardener for the summer. So I spent a lot of time with Abby working around uh, the house that Johanna's great grandparents had built up on the Thousand Islands. Right. And it was around that time that the Army Corps of Engineers was coming back again for another run at trying to get this thing called winter navigation, where they'd run these huge ships through the St. Lawrence River, which was a and the Clayton area, which was a very fragile ecosystem. There are thousands of islands in this stretch of the river, and it would have wreaked havoc on the, the environment. And so again, working together, became part of another massive organizing effort that, you know, we were successful at getting the Canadian government, the eight Great Lakes governor, the entire New York State delegation, all to come, off, come out against this $2 billion boondoggle and won. And, you know, it was during that time that I learned like what a you know a brilliant strategic thinker Abby was, uh, and what a good just basic grassroots organizer he understood. You had to talk to people and listen to people and agitate mm. people and give a vision mm. and have a plan of action, and encourage participation. And it was interesting because it was during that time that Abby actually started going to Nicaragua, Abby and Johanna, and at that time I didn't know anything about foreign policy, but I was starting to learn from him about what was happening, you know, opening up a whole nother world for me. Um, and then I helped them take a delegation of journalists to Nicaragua over New Year's 8045. That sort of firmly launched me into my work around the pledge and the Central America organizing. Mm -hmm. But the other piece I'll just share, you know, Abby's more well known for this, you know, uh, you know, his creative genius at cultural organizing from the levitating of the Pentagon to the 68 Chicago Democratic Convention and running a pig for office and then throwing dollar bills onto the floor of the stock exchange. And so I feel like I, I'm definitely working in his legacy in so many ways, you know, bringing both the strategic organizing, the basic uh, grassroots organizing, but bringing creativity and joy because, you know, this is hard work and mm -hmm. we, you know, without the joy and the fun and the humor and the camaraderie, you know, it, it, that's what nourishes us and keeps mm. us going through this. Did he ever uh, show you his yo-yo expertise? Um, I feel like I did see that once. You did? Okay, because 1968, he visited my college at Columbia. Here was yeah. takeover of the buildings, and we don't know when the imminent coming in of the police and there he was uh, in, in an unlit room with, who knows, hundreds of people there, giving a rousing talk with his yo-yo, his lighted yo-yo. And mm -hmm. i never forget this. And he had such perfect timing. Uh, he said, we're going to be smashing American imperialism. At the same time, of course, he threw down this lighted yo-yo and it smashed into a, a million pieces. And everybody was cheering. And yeah, it, it was magic again. And we all thought, well, okay, that's then. But no, it, it's, it's so important that the, the human connections, the, he was incorporating our fear, our, our anxiety, and yet the joy and the righteous indignation and this complex of, of, uh, of emotions and the traumas that we were experiencing yeah. as well. So I, I, you know, yeah, you, go ahead. You know, Jim, I, another thing about Abby, because yeah. he was coming through his work was coming through in the 60s, which was this very unique cultural revolution. And um, I have another shirt for you. Great. Uh, which actually fits really well oh, with this wow. interview. Um, Look at that. Th wow. A radical right. imagination sets you free, sets us free. To and arrest Trump. Just think yeah. about arresting Trump. 
Yeah, well, well we can go back to that. We won't okay. forget that. No, that that's terrific, um, thank you. But I think what's important to understand is that all of this work around, like the work Abby did, right. the work around direct action, the magic that happens in the streets when we come together in our creativity, we have an embodied sense of being free. And that is, you know, part of the gift of this work. Um, that that when we are free and in our power, we are most alive. And when we, uh, that's the sweet spot of what we're looking for is people to reclaim that, to honor that. Uh, and then from that place, we can also see the dignity and worth of everybody else. Um, so, yeah, I thought that'd and, be a good show for this moment. Absolutely. And, and of course, Abby wrote a book called Free. Uh-huh. Right? With this wonderful picture of him in midair, free. Um, Extinction Rebellion. I know you've, you've devoted a lot of energy and time recently to that. Um, I, I, I want to, uh, we've had him on the show two or three times, a good friend of ours here at the show, and I know a, a, a friend of yours too, Nick Brana, uh, who recently, uh, with, with several others, I think 15 or so, um, were involved in a hunger strike in Nancy Pelosi's office uh, all for about five days running and uh, last week. And, um, and this was part of, of course, a global movement uh, that uh, involved, I think it was, what, 27 countries and uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of people, young people, basically, around the world. Nick had uh, a couple of questions for you, if that's OK, uh, that he, he, he would like to ask you. And, and let me try to just read this here for you. Um, why, the, why the massive protests engulfing, engulfing many countries and changing governments hasn't come to the United States today. Why hasn't that happened? These are all sort of connected. What issues will motivate people to come out in these numbers here in the United States? A couple more. How can we as left movements develop a cohesive, unified, and escalating plan to bring them here to the United States? And most importantly, around what key issues or issues will such a coalition or revolution be built? I, I just gotta say that was a lot of questions. I'm sorry, one. yeah. I, but, let me, but let me just say- Break it down, break it, it down. That is, that is also sort of the question that many of us committed to social change are grappling with right now. As you see people rising up all around the world this past decade, it began with people rising up in the Arab Spring, spreading around the world. We're leaving this decade with mass uprisings. And what does it take to have happen here? And, you know, in fact, some of us went to D.C. in November trying to agitate a little bit around removing Trump because we know impeachment is not enough and it's not removal. And, you know, see him as the epitome of male supremacy, white supremacy, wealth supremacy, um, and that all of our issues are impacted by him. And that his removal would be an incredible victory for the people that could inspire a lot more. But exactly sort of even how one of the questions was framed, like what issues will get us there? I don't know that there's like certain issues that will get us there. Because part of the problem we're dealing with is that we have all these issues and our movements get siloed on these issues. Mm. And then we are so overwhelmed in each issue area that we lose sight of the importance of solidarity. Right. And so I think there's a way in which what we have to do is we kind of have to step back a little bit and go back to that, the foundations of organizing. You know, we, we, you know, our movements, as again, I said earlier, the nonprofits have sort of taken over a lot of the social movement space yep. and social media has become a major suck of time and distraction. There's not as much of the old school one-on-one -on -one building, organizing committees, embodied mm -hmm. coalitions, uh, outreach, leafleting, public leafleting, there's not so much of that in the same way anymore. And it was interesting because I just watched this documentary about Hong Kong that came out and sort of telling the story of how it started back in 2012, this different political moments, but the same thing of building power. And it started with basically going out on the streets and leafleting people and talking to people. Yeah, yeah. And so one of the hits I had is that you know, the space of the organized base that we feel like we need, 
through the move ons or the labor unions, the community based groups like, yes, that's important. But but that's very, um, I don't want to say finite. Uh, and I actually think that a lot of our potential is actually more out with the unorganized people. Um, so when we did this thing in DC, we thought a lot of these organized bases would turn their people out and they didn't. And, but what we did see was that thousands of people who were walking by us were like, I can't believe you're here. Thank you so much for yeah. taking photos. I mean, we had these little cards, arrest Trump, uh, these great banners in front of the white house. We had a 600 foot, uh, banner of the impeachment clause of the constitution. We would mic check and read it. I mean, mm -hmm. images of that went all over the world and people were just so excited. And we would do protests at night out, you know, uh, with the traffic and honk signs. It was like this cacophony of resistance and people would drive over park and come join us. So there's a sentiment out there that people are caring, but they're looking at where they can they express it. And I think one of the challenges, and this is again, something that we know that when you take a piece of ground and you hold it, over time, people will come. And I've seen this again and again. And Occupy was like that. Standing Rock was like that. Even Ferguson yeah. was like that. Yeah. Yeah. Camp Casey was like that. And we happened to be in this, you know, as I've been going on this, this book tour for Shut It Down, and I've been doing these trainings called Escalating Resistance, Mass, Re Mass Rebellion Training. I have been agitating exactly on this question about what is it going to take for us to come together and hold ground? You know, I, I look at the global climate strikes on, on September 20th in, you know, how millions of people all around the world came out, all across cities in this country, turned out for a day, marched, whereas we could have been shutting things down, and then everybody went home and there wasn't a plan for next steps. We just don't have the time, energy and resources for these one-offs. We need to look at concerted escalating campaigns that includes mass outreach, education, training, infrastructure building, and figuring out when is the time and place for us to throw down. <clears throat> so in these trainings, I've been, I had been suggesting April that let's go to DC and shut DC down in April. And then when impeachment happened, I was like, oh, maybe now is the time. So we tried to do this thing. And again, it didn't work the way we had hoped, something else emerged that was still nourishing. But I'm back to like, okay, come April, can we be prepared for, and again, we have to remember, we talked about this earlier, Jim, Right. you don't necessarily need the millions, even just a few thousand starting, like in Puerto Rico, it was a small radical feminist collective that kicked off what became the uprising that led to the resignation of the governor. So how do we start? How do we start it in a way that's inviting? And I actually think that there are a lot of people around this country with some time would make a choice to say, he's got to go, you know? Because mm -hmm. we can't, I don't believe we can wait for the, elector the elections. I know that's mm -hmm. the primary strategy people are pursuing. And, you know, I'm glad, you know, that that's got to be done. But what we know is that incumbents typically win. Right. The electoral system is is rigged and rigged. doesn't work yeah. right. Yeah. And we know the Democrats show that they can lose pretty much on their own. Right. Although we have seen success, but I think that uh, and the, the blue wave and all, but I think right. part of that was the nature of the candidates that were running. were not the same old school white dudes, right. but younger women of color who were speaking boldly about their truths and the reality that we're living in. And that's what we, we need candidates are going to lead with passion and a vision of something other than what is right now. So all that being said and done, I don't really have the answers, <laughs> but what I do know, and you know, when you and I met at the event in New York city with Francis Fox Piven, and we were talking about this, one of the things Francis said to all of us is that, you know, throughout history, when we've seen these things, we need to understand there were starts and stops. And the important thing is that we have to try. Mm -hmm. And so I, I left, uh, DC in mid November or whenever it was early November. And I was like, man, we sure didn't get what we were hoping for, but you know what? I know that I tried and something did happen and there is an energy out there. So how do we keep, where do we go next with this? Um, Absolutely. As Howard Zinn pointed out too, you poke here, you poke here, you poke a number of places and eventually it's going to come through. 
and, and actually we're, we've only got a, a, a few more minutes. We could go on and on, but, uh, and I want to, uh, and I play the, uh, the Cohen song yeah. about cracks and letting the light in. But um, also, I know you're working with or, uh, uh, Reverend Barber's Poor People's Campaign, and this moral transformation, the moral revolution of values, that could be in part the unifying vision the, from the prophetic tradition uh, uh, in Judaism and so on. But w what part does that play? I know your epilogue of your book is on um, healing uh, mm -hmm. and transformation. How does that play a part? We only have a couple more minutes, but if you want to say a couple words on that. Well, I mean, part of it is like to just become aware and recognize that something is not right. And I believe a lot of people in this country know that things aren't right. Then another step is understanding how we are complicit or cooperating with that injustice. Third, I think it's making each of us making that decision from our inner compass mm -hmm. that we are no longer going to be complicit. And then it's like getting with the other people. And yes, a revolution of values, or sometimes I say, look at the values of the dominant culture, figure out the exact opposite and put that into practice. And I think that's part of this work is how do we, you know, out of this World Social Forums came this idea and this quote, you know, another world is possible and on a quiet day you can hear her breathing. And I often like to say another world is possible and another world is now. Is we begin in this moment making conscious choices to be in a different, to utilize a different value base in our relationships that are, you know, honoring each person's unique gifts, Absolutely. slowing things down enough to really learn who they are, stop judging, comparing, contrasting, criticizing, um, being willing to uh, support each other even when we make mistakes. And, you know, I often say, like, in this moment, we are all we have. And so we have to figure out how we're going to take each other's hands and walk through the fire because that is the way we were going to be transformed. There's no going around. There's no going under or over. We have to go through this and we have to face our fears and we have to act with courage despite our fears. And, and we have to be willing to take risks and go into the unknown, knowing that at that edge of chaos that we can create, new potentials exist. Beautiful. Um, we and yeah. And with radical love, I, I, we've only got a couple of more seconds to go. Uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel put it also nicely. Some of us are guilty, all are responsible. So mm -hmm. we've got to take that into, yeah. into, into our uh, consciousness as well. Here's the book, Shut It Down. Yes. Okay. B I don't know if you can buy see it. Buy it. it. Oh, there's a bigger one. Okay, bigger version. Shut It Down. Lisa, thank you so very, very much for being on the show. We'll see you again very soon. Love your t-shirt. Love you so much. Be strong. We'll see you next week on The Radical Imagination. This is Jim Brettles. Thank you so much, Lisa, again. Thank very you so much. much, Jim. Peace all. Peace. Thank you so much for your warm hospitality this evening. We are so grateful to play for you. <laughs> I heard that. Thank you so much, friends. We're so privileged to be able to gather in moments like this when so much of the world is plunged in darkness and chaos. So, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. The birds they sang at the break of day start again I seem to hear them say do not dwell on what has passed away or what is yet to be. Yeah.
and the war they will be fought again the holy dove she will be caught again but and soul and but again the dove is never free Forget your 